This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Richard Burridge. He is the managing director of Simigo. Simigo is an independent Asian market research and consulting firm. That's kind of the, you know, the CV stuff. I'm not going to say boring. Richard's a pretty cool guy, but you know, I got to get that out of the way. I got to tell you who he is and what he does. But here's the cool thing. Richard is random, at least random to me, because I randomly connected with Richard after receiving, I think, a random email. And when I say random email, it was just a cool email that told me something about him and his business and that he happened to be living in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Now, of course, if you go down a rabbit hole like that, a guy doing market research in a booming place like Ho Chi Minh City, there's going to be more to the story, a lot more. So for all of you out there that are curious how people can be living in the UK or America and then just end up somewhere in Asia and make it all work and go on an adventure, start a life, start a family. My guest today, Richard Burridge, has a lot of answers or at least a really cool story about how he went down the path. So without any further delay from me, let's jump right in and check out and have a conversation with Richard Burridge. Richard, place me your first moment, and I want to know age, the first moment you hit Asia. I was 21 and I landed in Mumbai. You said Mumbai. Yeah. So I finished university and I had an uncle who taught at LSE and he uh, used to coordinate and rotate with somebody in Berkeley and somebody in Jose University in Tokyo. The person he would swap with in Tokyo had suggested that his son come out to Japan and experience Japan. And at the time, Japan was sort of renowned for its management style and I was studying business and it had been talked about a lot at university for me but his son wasn't that interested so I sort of piped up and said well I'd love to go and I had a month between finishing my exams at university and needing to be in Tokyo so I spent that month foolishly actually. Hold on, hold on. You said you ended up in India first or Tokyo first? Mumbai first so I spent a month in, in India on my way heading to Tokyo. Ah, ah, ah. Because I had a month to kill. So I thought I'd go and have a look at India. I mostly went down to Goa, but a little time in Mumbai or Bombay, as I know it, on the way. Now, I know I'm dating you when I ask this, and I'm not trying to, but you're getting to Tokyo age 21. What year are we talking? 1992. 1992. What was the initial feeling? of going to Tokyo. I still recall there's this great Anthony Bourdain episode where he talks about showing up in Tokyo for the first time. And it's just like an LSD experience or not that I've done LSD, but just some kind of like crazy first time spiritual experience. And I felt that for the first time and it was probably 2006, 1992 though. What did you feel? How did it feel? Of course, the contrast having just left India after a month was phenomenal. And I remember landing, it was early in the morning. And as I looked out of the plane, sort of at the runway, there were runway support staff, I guess, airport support staff, ground staff, doing exercises and being led, I assume, by a supervisor in exercises, and then sort of bowing to the supervisor and then rushing off to do their duties. And then, of course, when you hit Tokyo, central Tokyo, to this day, there's It's the only place in the world I think you can go to and say, well, there really is nowhere else like this. It is so different than everywhere else. A great example of that would be showing up in Shibuya for the first time at that intersection. Right. What a wonderful intersection. It's staggering. It hits every sense. 
every possible sense you feel it in and the food you eat, the quality of everything you come across, the service levels, just phenomenal. And the eye is just constantly uh, engaged in what's going on around because it is so different from what you're used to. How long did you stay there? I spent six months there, actually. So I then went up into the hills on the edge of a volcano and worked in a hotel. Again, this was a relative of this professor who owned the hotel. Again, it was a fascinating experience. I was very out of my depth, not very comfortable, actually, for the first few months. I was struggling with Asian food and young 21-year-old away from home, not really sure what was going on, a little bit naive. But it was, in hindsight, a fantastic experience, of course. Now, for my lady listeners, I don't say this or ask this in any kind of untoward way, but as a 21-year-old guy showing up in Tokyo, were the ladies interested in you? Were you interested in them? I remember post the experience in the hotel, I thought, well, maybe I'll stay around in Tokyo for a bit. And I tried to get a job teaching English, but I was most upset to learn that most people weren't interested in my English English, and they would much rather American English. But back to your question, in the hotel, there was, it was a very sort of weekend guest out of Tokyo coming to this hotel, a very traditional sort of Japanese hotel. There wasn't much interest. There was somebody who I befriended who was a relative of the family. And I think she, well, I know that when I came to leave, that she stood up publicly and announced that she was also leaving and would be traveling with me. And I think she had a misguided perception of what my travels might look like. So I had to sort of correct that quite strongly. In Tokyo, it was very easy to go out and meet other young single women. Yeah, for sure. It was maybe a little too easy, but maybe the wrong sort of women in the, who were just sort of party girls, if you like. Yeah, and I don't ask that in a funny way. I think it's just something when people, I want my audience to kind of live through your eyes. And it's for those that have not had a chance to come to Asia still, it's such a different experience. And it can be different for men and women for different reasons. But it's so culturally different. I think it would be easy to have a fun night and meet a bunch of women and have a great time out. But actually getting beyond the surface, it's probably the hardest country in the region to actually assimilate into the culture and into the language and really befriend people. I mean, I have a few friends now in Japan that from that experience, but it's very, very hard to break through and really understand people. It takes a long time. You've probably experienced that yourself. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I love Tokyo. I love Japan for all the reasons you say, but it, there are some barriers even beyond if I spoke the language, I think there would still be some barriers. Definitely. I don't think I could live there for that reason. I think it would be quite lonely as a foreigner to live there because it's really hard to become assimilated. I love visiting. I love going back in normal times around this time of year. It's autumn. It's beautiful. The people are beautiful. The food is beautiful. I had some amazing experiences. I mean, I remember being on a train going down to Kyoto and chatting to a young lady who was, I think, a high school student on the train and explaining to her what I was doing. And she was practicing her English. Said goodbye when I got out at the train station. And it wasn't quite the city train station. It was near a temple somewhere. I forget the name. Anyway, I'm walking along 20 minutes later because there were no taxis, making my way to this shrine. Uh, and then a car pulls up, she's in the back and it's her parents. And her parents said, well, let us give you a ride. And they gave me a ride. And they said, well, if you're going to this shrine, you should also have an experience of a tea ceremony. So they took me to that experience. Then they took me to lunch and were just the most pleasant people and the most hospitable people. And all my experiences, particularly outside of Tokyo, were would always repeat similar exercises of just people really going out of their way to be hospitable, friendly, and, and explain to you their country. Another train journey, I was sat next to a woman who'd lived through the nuclear bomb. And she described to me, of course, a much older woman, described to me what she went through on that day and on the days after and what she saw. I mean, literally had me in tears for about 90 minutes as we were on the train journey. But she really wanted to share her experiences. So people are phenomenally hospitable. But again, it's quite hard to break through to befriend people. Let me jump you up a little bit in time. I believe your first major work experience, markets, whatnot, would have been in Hong Kong? That's correct. I left Japan and went to Hong Kong. I did a number of the oddest jobs from barman to extras in movie to removal man, never be a removal man in Hong Kong, until I found uh, something more related to my academic studies, which was working in a small market research company. That was in 1992, 1993. 
let me jump it up even further because I just wanted to kind of lay this background of a guy making it to Asia and reminding me of myself, not knowing what to expect. And the next thing you know, your life changes. But there's a pivot now that happens where the real change happens. And at some point in time, you make your first trip to where? Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon? Where did you go first? Oh, my first trip was to Hanoi. And that would have been in 1994. And so I was tasked with a delicate exercise for the country. And it was a little bit sensitive, which was testing a tobacco product for Dunhill, actually, which was owned by Rothmans at the time, and running some product tests for them in Hanoi. So just to set the stage here, 1994, Clinton had been in office for a couple of years. I don't know if he had yet normalized relations. But we're looking at about eight years after 1986. And I want you to tell the audience what happened in Vietnam in 1986, because it was the real pivot to the crazy growth and all the things that you and I are going to talk about in the next little while. But in 1986, it was the start of a boom, a baby boom and an economic boom. Why don't you start to paint this picture here? Because coming here in 1994, before America had established relations, we're talking about a really different point in time for Vietnam. To picture a street scene, for example, there were hardly any cars, some motorbikes, and mostly bicycles when I first arrived in 1994. And it was also an environment where I was very much during my 10 days of my first trip to Vietnam, everybody I would meet would tell me that they would then be interviewed subsequent to my meeting them because it was still very much a let's make sure that these visitors aren't up to no good. So I was constantly uh, monitored and followed to satisfy people that my intentions were not ill intentions. So that was the physical environment. Of course, service and hotels was availability was very simplified. But going back to your question of really what was that pivot and what happened, people forget that Vietnam's last war was in 79. So that was a border incursion with China. 79 to 86 was a very tough time in Vietnam. And then things started to open a little bit in terms of a new policy, which was called Doi Moi, which just means renovation or new beginnings, if you like, which was opening the door to the outside world. And that enabled Vietnam to embark on a new journey, which enabled foreign company and capital to access the market of Vietnam. In 88, there was a huge agricultural reform, which basically turned Vietnam from a net importer of rice to feed the population to a net exporter of rice and very quickly became, I think, the third largest exporter of rice by about 1990, just because people were allowed to benefit from their own production, uh, if you like. 1991, you saw TV advertising was suddenly allowed. It hadn't been allowed before that. So in 1990, there was no TV advertising, just to think about that in perspective. And then really what happened in 1994, the big shift was the US lifted their embargo on Vietnam. Vietnam suddenly became an acceptable place for the U.S. to do business with and to export products to take a year forward. And then Vietnam joined the ASEAN group. And I think by 1997, it was the first or the second largest exporter of rice and so forth. So then things kept on developing over the following years. Let me keep you at that first trip because you described meeting people in Tokyo for the first time. Now, my first time in Vietnam was 2013, and I didn't get a chance to see any of the things that you were talking about. I All I didn't see, I knew that no one really cared that I was in the country, and uh, I was just on my visa. And the thing that I noticed immediately was this insatiable curiosity about me, like just an interest in me, men or women. Like, who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? I'm happy to see you. Can I talk to you? I just, just over the top. I mean... Um, how was that when you first came? Was it still the same kind of atmosphere where it's like, we just want to talk to you, you're so different? So yes, and put that in perspective. So if I was Vietnamese, as a Vietnamese national at the time, I needed a visa to leave the country. I had no access to the internet and I had no foreign media access. You can imagine there was a very sort of naive view of the outside world and starved of information. Of course, people were, where they were able to communicate in English were extraordinarily happy to have those conversations. In the early years, you had to be careful and people had to be careful what they talked about because they literally were, the Ministry of Public Security staff would interview them after they met me as a foreigner. A little less openness at the time. 
a little less openness, but those who could speak that you could communicate with were once they relaxed, were very happy to have a conversation and they were very supportive that your actions were helping to bring business and opportunity to the marketplace. And of course, you then have a very separate group of people, which was much younger people who are really keen, really, really keen just to have the experience of practicing the English. Because despite a lot of students studying English and doing quite well in their written English, their ability with the teaching staff in Vietnam to talk, there was very little conversation going on. That was always phenomenal. The older generation would prefer actually at the time to speak to you in French, and there was more likelihood that they could speak French than English, but that sort of progressed and changed over the following years. Yes, an insatiable appetite for conversation, for information, and the oddest questions. I mean, just the myths that people had at the time about us as foreigners and certainly as Westerners could be quite staggering. People were very open to ask how much you weighed, <laughs> what your salary was. Hold on, that's not changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to be quite literal in their observations of you, you're slightly overweight, um, you know, and things like Hold that. On, they don't, but, they don't uh, say slightly overweight, they say fat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm being polite. <laughs> um, okay, so pivot for me again. At some point in time, these early experiences and set the year, you decided, I've seen enough of Vietnam, I'm going to live there. And what year was that? So actually, I had a couple of trips in 94. And then I thought, you know what, I need to go to Vietnam more often. It's going to be a very interesting future. I need to learn some language. So I went to the Vietnamese consulate in Hong Kong where I was living, and I met a gentleman from Haiphong. He was one of the consular staff, and he agreed to start teaching me Vietnamese. And before long, he said to me, well, Richard, why don't you, I have friends at the university in Haiphong. Why don't you go to the university in Haiphong? They'll teach you Vietnamese properly. They'll give you a dormitory room and you can teach the students English. And I really considered this, and I actually resigned from my job, at which point my employer said, mm, we're going to double your salary to keep you, which worked. But actually, within by 1997, I said, you know what? I really am going to go to uh, Vietnam. I think it's got a, a very bright future, and there's an opportunity for me to sort of set my own path and build my own business eventually there. So that's when I moved. So I moved in 1997, just in May, and in June 97 was the handover of Hong Kong back to China. And so in 1997, I moved here to Saigon. I would have moved to Hanoi. I actually preferred Hanoi, but there just wasn't the job opportunities. And I joined an agency that's today known as Kantar. It was known as something else back then. I think I was employee number six or something. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was a wonderful experience. I had a great boss who's still here today and a friend today. So that's how I came to live here. I lived in a shared house, mostly with, uh, actually with three Americans. It was really a, a very charming, wonderful life. It wasn't that much to do. Often by lunch, it was sort of, um, hmm, maybe this is going to be a long lunch. There's not that much work going on. Of course, that changed as the economy progressed and foreign interest progressed. But it was really a wonderful experience. I was very privileged to enjoy it. Before I get into some of the kind of big picture insights to give people a feel for how far Vietnam has progressed. I'll let you run with my thought that I'm having here because a lot of people are going to hear some of the things you're saying and they're going to anchor on things and they're not necessarily going to understand that even though there were past moments in Vietnam, and this really is all countries, but I think there's something unique about Vietnam and it's how fast it leapfrogs, how fast it transitions from one point to the other and just in some ways leaves the past in the dust in many ways. Can you speak to this issue? Because it's quite phenomenal. A lot of people, and I've met a lot of writers over the years, who they struggle to articulate what is so fascinating to the foreign visitor to Vietnam and the foreign business person. And it really is a, it's an energy and a diamondism that is hard to match and to think of anywhere else that would have had the speed of change that Vietnam, and particularly Saigon within Vietnam, represents. I can think of only perhaps China in the mid 80s to mid 90s that saw such a rapid progression. But essentially, as the economy opened, it sort of, and with a, a very young population, you just had this energy and flow, if you like, within the cities that was quite straggling to watch. Coming back to your, well, what's been leapfrogged, most people haven't grown up with a physical telephone in their homes and don't have one today. Most young people today in Vietnam 
never had a credit card, but will have a mobile wallet. You get this sort of leapfrogging of ideas because Vietnam is in the unfortunate position of somewhat being behind the rest of the developed world's progress. And that it can really leapfrog technologies and processes that took years of societies in other countries to move through. And a credit card is a great example because it took a long time for the likes of Visa and MasterCard and American Express to convince people not to fill their wallets with cash and to move to credit card payment systems. It's never really worked here. They've never really had significant movement on getting people to use credit cards. And now the world has, has jumped straight forward into mobile wallets and mobile banking all on the smartphone. You had a take up of smartphones, which is another great example that fueled some very listed companies, Teo Dong, which is Mobile World, and connected with a consumer finance companies such as Home Credit and FE Credit basically took mobile penetration to one of the highest in the world. And over a five-year span, we went from zero smartphone penetration to 86% of the population today having a smartphone, adult population. With that, it enables huge leaps forward. Another example I like to use is the idea of flexitarian and veganism and things like that, which have taken a lifetime in my home country, the UK, to evolve into something that's socially acceptable and looking at almond milks and walnut milks and other uh, barista style uh, environments where it's no longer cow's milk. And today in Vietnam, we have <laughs> all those milks suddenly available within the last year and becoming part of people's shopping basket without them ever going through the years of vegetarianism and sort of fringe movements that created the environment that finally saw a, a critical mass or a tipping point being reached in more mature developed markets. If it's a good idea, the acceptance can be very fast. The acceptance can be very fast, that's true. And also, there is one downside to that at a very basic level is that you have a lot of streets in Vietnam that have the same shops. And really because the Vietnamese are also, they're creative in some areas, but they're also very good at saying, well, wait a minute, they're making money, we'll replicate what they do. All of a sudden, one coffee shop turns into 10 or one beef steak restaurant turns into 10 or one hot pot restaurant turns into 10 lining the same street. Let me take it to an issue. I've got many Vietnamese men and Vietnamese women friends here. And the issue that I'm going to bring up with you is something that I've talked with both of them about. It's always a fascinating conversation. And I find the Vietnamese men in many ways will look at and talk about and think about what I'm going to say to you in the same way that I do. And that is the Vietnamese women. And Vietnamese women I find terribly unique and for two particular reasons. They have, compared to me growing up in the States, and I'm not gonna say this for everybody. I mean, of course, Sheryl Sandberg runs Facebook, brilliant woman. There's a lot of brilliant executives in America. But the women in Vietnam bring to the table this high level, often very educated entrepreneurial spirit, a gung-ho drive, and then they kind of cross it with this exotic, thin beauty. And I'm talking to you, and I gotta tell the audience right out of the gate, I mean, obviously you're gonna agree with that in some ways because I know you ended up finding a very nice wife and have kids and all that kind of stuff. Speak to this issue though. It's a really fascinating issue to have women at a level of super high intellect. I mean, the first entrepreneurial billionaire in Vietnam was a woman, the lady that started Vietjet. And then to cross it with the, I'm going to look really good too. It's just a fascinating thing to me. And maybe some women listeners are going to be like, oh, Mike, you just sound like a guy who was single or something. No, it's more than that. There's a little bit of history to this. The party has rewritten history to make it a patriarchal society in text. But the reality is that it's a matriarchal society. And this plays out in a number of spheres. Let's take India as an example. Three in 10 women in India work. In Vietnam, it's 88% or nearly 9 in 10 of adult women work, earn money. So not only work from a household point of view and look after the household and the children, but they also work. Which means power. Well, it means money. <laughs> it means power. It also, in my view, makes some of the men slightly less assertive in the workplace than they might otherwise be. It does give them power and it gives them money. And also at the home they are responsible for the market money, the tinger in local language, which means as a husband, you're supposed to, I can't say I do it, but you're supposed to give your money, your wages, your salary to your wife to look after for the household budget. And again, so that creates even more power for the woman. 
So she's fundamentally making the household decisions, also working. And as an employer here, I mean, my office is 95% women because, frankly, they strive harder, they work harder. Men are great at negotiating and doing deals in coffee shops and bars. But fundamentally, I would argue most of the hard graft is done by women. You think I'm talking only about an office? I'm not. If you go to a building site, the people carrying the bricks up the ladders are women. And they also have unprecedented price knowledge. In my world of statistically testing prices and uh, modeling pricing and this sort of thing, in most markets, it's hard to do because the price knowledge of the consumer is not strong. I mean, a Vietnamese mother can reel off the whole price of everything that she's filled a shopping basket full of. It's quite staggering to perceive, to see. Then you also talked about their elegance. I mean, I have to agree. I think <laughs> this maybe sounds wrong. I mean, but the most beautiful women that I've come across in Asia are Japanese or Vietnamese. And for Japanese women, frankly, it's because they can afford to be beautiful. They dress very elegantly. They're very well branded in their dress and they can afford to look good. And ever since I've come to Vietnam, I've looked at the Vietnamese women and thought, my God, how elegant the stature they hold. Their backs are extraordinarily straight. Some people would put that down to traditional school dress and traditional dress of the Alzai. But they are extraordinarily elegant and their stature is phenomenal and they don't need high fashion, perhaps like the Japanese do, just to come across as a very elegant, attractive, beautiful woman. You're right in that also. I used to joke that uh, 75% of Vietnamese women were beautiful and 25% were gorgeous. Let me shift it into, we could stay and have all these interesting conversations to talk about beauty. And I guess my audience is probably 60, 70% male and they'll love that. Maybe a second off the grid episode for that. But let me shift it into entrepreneurism. And I saw a chart the other day and it was called support for the free market system. And the way that it said, it said, it asked people around the world, most people are better off in a free market economy, even though some people are rich and some people are poor. For example, in America, that was agreed to 70%. South Korea, 78%. China, 76%. In Vietnam, that was agreed to at 95%. Now, you're a guy that knows stats and stuff. Maybe it's a little off. It was Pew Research just a couple of years back. But there really is this dynamism inside people's minds when it comes to making money. Why don't you speak to this? Let's open this up. Yeah. So it's certainly the ambition when we do consumer studies, it's everyone's ambition. In the UK, everyone's ambition is to be an author and write a book. In Vietnam, everyone's ambition is to own their own business. The person they look up to still today, I'm going to forget his name now, is the guy who runs Microsoft. Help me. Bill Gates. Thank you. Because they see that as a rags to riches story and a self-made person and the wealth that's been self-made rather than through nepotism. So everybody desires to be an entrepreneur. You know, if you look at small businesses, then half of them are run by women in this country. It's quite staggering. Very much an ambition and a desire. Most people, the other thing that people don't realize about this country is that most people have 1.67 jobs or sources of income. Throwing statistics out there, but most people have a secondary source of income, which is normally some form of private business run out of the home. It might be a car rental company. It might be a tour company. But most people have their career in the factory or in the office, but they also have a secondary source of income. Contrast that. Do you know some other countries off the top of your head? Where does that 1.67 contrast with other Western countries, for example? I seriously doubt America is anywhere close to that. I mean, if I had to guess, I would say America is pretty close to one. I would say most countries are probably pretty close to one. Southeast Asia, I think, is a little bit unique. But it really varies. So Indonesia, you're going to get far less women working than you do in Vietnam. India, I talked about three in 10 versus nine in 10 in Vietnam. A lot of it's religion and cultural mores and values that set almost a permission level for women to work as what's seen as uh, socially acceptable to do. And it's very socially acceptable here for women to work and they're extraordinarily strong. It's one of the major boosts to the Vietnamese economy because, of course, if you have so many women work, your dependency ratio, which is the number of people earning to the number of people who are dependent on somebody's earning, drops dramatically. And it really fuels gross domestic product. I mean, it really <laughs> has a significant impact. It's one of the key drivers of the Vietnamese economy and why it's progressed and its growth is so strong. It's because that dependency ratio is 0 
So dependence per employed person is only 0.7, less than one. That's phenomenal as a GDP booster. As a side tangent, keep it in India and Indonesia for a moment. I know it might not be your specialty, but you know the region, you know the area. My gosh, if Indonesia, I think it's 250 million people, I believe, or 175 million, and India is probably north of 1.4 billion. I mean, close proximity of what those numbers are. If you got the female participation in the labor force in Indonesia or India to jump up, I mean, gosh, the West should be shaking in their boots, right? I mean, I mean, God, would just there would be nothing else except Asia in the next hundred years. Well, I sus- <laughs> to be honest, I suspect you know the next century is Asia's century for economic progress and quality of life progress. But absolutely, Vietnam's always had ever since I've arrived. They've always felt like we need to catch up with our neighbors. We're on the back foot, and we need to catch up. I've got offices all around the region. The most hardest working people that I have in the region, and I hope no one else listens, but are those in Vietnam because they really want to catch up. They know they were on the back foot and they want to catch up with their neighbors. And of course, what I've seen over the last 20 years is they really are beginning to catch up. And their aspiration is to have a Saigon that looks like Singapore. The thing that struck me in preparing to talk with you is I saw that 1.67 sources of income, and I had not seen that data point. I just have my own experience in being in the country. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't speak the language other than basic taxi instructions. I get along with everybody. But what was it early on that struck me beyond being a single guy and thinking the ladies were pretty, but there was something else. And even though I didn't speak the language, I think by osmosis, I was feeling that entrepreneurial energy. So as a guy who grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, where most people were government workers, and I was an entrepreneur, and I never fit in, and I wanted to pull my hair out because everyone just bored me to tears. To come to a country, I didn't know any of the data that you knew. All I could just was the walking the streets and feel it. And I think it must have swayed me. And hell, I couldn't even talk with the people to really know what their motivations were until I talked to a guy like you. But I think even just not knowing the language by osmosis, I could feel that entrepreneurial energy, and it's seductive. It is. I mean, it keeps a lot of people here and it makes a lot of people who've come for shorter stints and had to leave really reminisce, I mean, and miss the energy that exists in Vietnam. Because I don't know where else you can match that energy. Maybe somewhere in uh, South America that I haven't visited will have a similar energy level, but it's, I haven't seen it anywhere else in Europe or Asia. When you describe the energy, what do you mean exactly? You see it on the street, the people, the walking Get it to that granular level for you, what the energy is. Yeah, it's almost a buzz and and excitement. You know, when someone takes one of those pictures of a city scene and they've put the exposure on really slow and they capture the movement of all the lights going around with the traffic, that implies a movement and an energy through whatever that scene is that they've created. It's really that sense that sort of gets down to your bone. Everywhere you look, there's an opportunity. Everywhere you look, someone's taking advantage of that opportunity. I can be in the remotest place in Vietnam riding a bicycle. I can stop for a rest with a beautiful scenery in front of me. And then I can hear a rustle behind me and there's someone trying to sell me a piece of fruit behind me. It's like, where did you come from? How did you find me? But they found the customer. They saw the opportunity. And it's just constant everywhere you look. You got to show up and experience it almost, right? You almost can't put it in writing. It's got to be And even if you saw a movie, even if someone saw the visuals, it's different when you're standing there and you can just feel it. You heard of that concept of flow, you know, when you're at work and you're really into what you're doing and eight hours go by and you look up. I can quote the name of that professor, Mahali Chiksamahai. Well done. (laughs) Glad you could. It's like the whole city is in that flow. That's the only way I can describe it. It's like the whole city is moving with a momentum and a cadence that is in the perfect flow and no one should interrupt it. Well, it's like when you watch motorbikes, right? You expect there's going to be accidents every one second or road rage every one second and it doesn't happen. That's a good analogy, actually, because the philosophy of being on a motorbike or any form of vehicle is to do your utmost to keep moving and not stop, but also not kill anyone. People don't stop at lights, at pedestrian crossings. They'll find a way through if there's traffic or there's flooding. And it's almost that analogy. I will keep moving. I will keep moving forward, 
even if I have to slow down so that I can continue my journey and progression. Here's a great example. If you are trying to cross the street, the worst thing you can do as a walker is to start, stop, or try to figure out what the bikes are going to do. What you do is just go and trust that they won't kill you. Yeah. Don't change your pace. Go slowly. And the other day I was crossing and I noticed this bike was coming towards me and stopping and starting and whatever. And he got close and it was a white guy. And I just thought, oh my God, get off the street. You don't, you're going to kill me. You're driving wrong. <laughs> Let me shift to something else that I think is really interesting. I love going to China when I get a chance. You know, I was there in 2019. But you know, it's a little frustrating when you get there and you have your internet access or your internet tools are commandeered. Not commandeer is not the right word, but you just can't use certain things. That's just the way it is in China. And look, I've been in Bangkok and seen websites filtered. I've been in Singapore and seen websites filtered. I think actually I've been in KL and seen stuff filtered. The internet in Vietnam, and look, people, everyone out there listening knows the form of government. That's what they've chosen. We're talking about a lot of progress. People can talk about forms of government and debate and all this kind of stuff. But the internet in Vietnam is wide open. Yeah, and there has been talk, for example, of creating Vietnam's own social network so there's greater control over the data and the conversation. But I think that the Vietnamese government do a very good job at managing expectations of the public and also communication to the public and the freedom to access media today. I mean, it changed a lot probably since about 2005. Prior to that, it was a little bit more difficult. But they realized the strength that it has for the economy. And there are sort of government-led policies and initiatives to further drive the digitalization of the economy and the accessibility of the internet. That's the other amazing thing. If I sit in Paris in a coffee shop and I want Wi-Fi connection, well, I probably have to go and pay for it. And it's probably quite annoying to even get on. Certainly last time I was there. But if I'm in Vietnam, the, I really only have to walk 100 yards to find a free Wi-Fi service. It is quite staggering. I think it's proactively managed for the growth of the economy. And again, it's another key driver behind why the economy is doing so well is that digitalization of services. You know, it's a side tangent. And we talked about the strength and elegance of the women of Vietnam earlier. I have to say one of the most interesting things for me and I do think this would be interesting, honestly, for men or women who have never been to Vietnam. It will affect men a little bit differently, but I think women will be quite impressed too. When one sees the algae, the dress, the traditional dress, when you see that for the first time in person, and let's say you just came from a traditional Western place, suburban, whatever, and you see the algae flowing down the street, and this is a dress that unlike, for example, in my home country, America, where Everybody wants to show as much skin and cleavage as possible. The algae doesn't show skin, literally only the face. It's a really amazing cultural symbol for the country, isn't it? It is. And it is beautiful because it's so elegant and, as you say, so flowing. And you're right. There is absolutely no skin to be shown. By the way, it's also available for men. So, I mean, I wore an algae at my own wedding. They're terribly uncomfortable. Vietnamese women will tell you, yes, beautiful, wonderful. And of course, you can have different alzheimer's for different occasions, but they're terribly uncomfortable for them to wear because they really do enforce a stature, which is there is no slouching in an alzheimer's because it's physically impossible. You have to keep your back perfectly straight and upright. I guess they're disappearing a little bit at schools as, uh, as school uniforms modernize and alzheimer's mostly come out now at important um, holidays and celebrations and weddings. But yes, it's a wonderful national dress. I got one last issue I want to bring out with you. Look, I've taken you all kinds of different topics, but farm to plate. Recently, I've gotten addicted to watching some of these old Gordon Ramsay kitchen nightmare episodes. When you watch Gordon Ramsay, and you're like, I don't know what people think about him. I kind of like him. He's really tough on fresh food. I'll tell you something interesting that I see in Vietnam. You could have some orange juice or some leftovers or something in the refrigerator. And Vietnamese don't trust it after one day. This is a very, 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 we want it fresh place, isn't it? Very much so. I mean, it also comes back to your earlier point, possibly about leapfrogging. I mean, I don't think Vietnam will ever go through the sort of rise of prepackaged meals, packaged food, tin food, 
to the same degree, of course there is some and there will be some, to the same degree as certainly my home country has. Here the shopper, mum generally, shops for fresh food daily. There isn't a such a huge weekly shop. It's very much a wet market, fresh food purchase most mornings. I mean, I was at the wet market this morning picking up food and fruit, and particularly for my family, but that's where the shopping's done. So the refrigerator has primarily been used for beverages and sauces. Refrigerator shelves for that we were used to from a Western context hold less relevance. Really, they need to be designed for, for drinks, for water and other drinks, but also for hooks, for hanging sauces, which are used for cooking and dipping when you're eating your food. But most people would shop on a daily basis for meat, vegetables and fruit. By the way, I got one more question I'm going to take you into because I think this question really ties up the attitude and the spirit of Vietnamese. You just mentioned the term wet market. I should let you clarify because I think if Americans are listening right now and they hear the term wet market, they were kind of like hit six months of hearing the term wet market at the beginning of this year and probably think that every, quote, wet market in Asia is filled with dastardly stuff that will kill the world tomorrow. This is a cultural issue or a cultural aspect of Asia that's never going to go away. And what happened in terms of this virus may or may not have come from a wet market in China, but wet markets in China don't just happen to be in Wuhan in one place. It's a cultural identity there as it is here. Correct. I mean, every district, there's 23, I think, districts in Ho Chi Minh City would have multiple wet markets. There's probably about 80 to 120, I forget now, wet markets in Ho Chi Minh City. Is wet market just selling fresh food, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh meat, seafood? Yeah, primarily it's a wet market because it's not air conditioned. It, it's enclosed, but it is a daily process that starts about 3.30 a.m. And most of the business is, is finished and concluded by about 9 a.m. It's the daily delivery of fruit, meat, vegetables from outer areas of the city by traders coming in for the morning shoppers. Not much going on after uh, 9 o'clock in the morning there anymore. But that's where most people would be buying their daily food. Let's put that in a numbers perspective. Modern trade, where there is aircon, like a supermarket or a convenience store, accounts for less than 20% of grocery sales. Traditional trade, which is wet markets, but also your mum and pup type grocery store, is accounting for just over 80%. And there is, in most wet markets, there is nothing obscure. I mean, there is pork, chicken, fish, fruit and vegetables. There aren't the scary things that a Wuhan image might project to foreigners. Let me share one last thing with you. Before we were speaking, I was in a particular group, and the author, Tim Ferriss, who's written a bunch of books, has a big podcast, he posted a question to this small group, and he said, I'm feeling a little uh, leery. I'm paraphrasing Tim, but he said, I'm feeling a little leery about COVID. How does everyone in America feel right now? How do you feel outside of America? Are we going to need a lockdown? Is there going to be a third wave? All this kind of stuff. And he was just trying to gather information, and I kind of gave the summary of what's happened in Vietnam. But what's happened in Vietnam with COVID is really amazing when you look at countries like America and Spain and the UK. It's staggering. And it's one of the major benefits of having a socialist republic where you have very strong state controls and a very strong organizational network of government and authorities that can put in controls and put in controls quickly. I haven't seen the latest numbers. As of the end of September, we were at 1,035 cases in total, <laughs> not a day in total. And 100 million people. I mean, look, if we're all scientists around the world and we've had 200,000 deaths in America at 350 million people, and we've had 50, 50, five zero deaths in Vietnam with 100 million people, it sure seems like if all of us around the world are curious about how things work, that we might start trying to examine the pieces of this game a little bit closer. I find a strange joy in watching the Houses of Parliament in the UK and the debates that go on. And they just make me laugh, the things they're talking about, because they miss the whole construct of really what it takes to eradicate and control a pandemic and a communicable pandemic, which is, of course, what Vietnam did, which is shut down borders and schools and locked down very quickly. The UK, for example, has never shut its borders. Anyone can fly in and might be advised to quarantine, but there's no follow up to actually check they do. And yet they wonder why they're not actually hitting a second wave. It's just a continuation because they never really put the brakes on and controlled anything. I don't know enough about your country, but it's probably similar with much of the developed world. 
Oh, come on. You've turned on CNN. You know America's gone crazy. We're close to serving Jim Jones Kool-Aid from Guyana in America. I think it's coming soon. Hey, Richard, great stuff. I enjoy picking your mind and you taking you around the Maypole, so to speak. Get all your experiences. Hopefully you've kind of spurred some people to think about or rethink or re-understand what they think they might know or not know. Where can we send people? Where would you like to direct them to? To check you out, check out your business, check out some of your market research. Where can we send them? I think if anyone's interested in a business context or a consumer context on Vietnam, visit our website, which is simigo.com. And there's lots of freely available reports and blogs on what's going on in Vietnam. And then, of course, when the world does open up again to travel, come visit, because I've never met anybody who's been disappointed with their journey, whether for personal leisure or business, into Vietnam. So come visit. And certainly happy to take anyone through consumer trends if they're ever visiting the marketplace or give them some recommendations. So simigo.com, or if they have any specific questions, just ask at simigo.com, and I'll see that email and respond. C-I-M-I-G-O.com. What's the root of the name? It's a Klingon ship in Star Trek. The name of my company is uh, Marleybone, and that's because when I was in grad school in London, I lived in the neighborhood. So there you go. There you go. (laughs) Richard, great stuff. Appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks so much for having me. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.